Hello everyone, this is our Fintern Barrow, episode number 10, and today we've got a video for you, and that's so we can see Jake Julie Lewin's special station house that he's in, which actually used to be a station house in Fintern Village, where there used to be trains. Uh, today we're going to talk about Jake growing up in Fintern Eco Village. He's the son of Carl J. Lewin, who we already talked to about Dance North. And also Deborah Lewin, who he sometimes DJs with. And Jake's also very involved in the Global Eco Village Network. So, Jake, what's been your involvement in the Global Eco Village Network? Oh, that's a big question. Um, what's been, what has been my involvement in the Global Eco Village Network? I guess it might make sense to start with to give a little bit more, a couple of distinctions about Gen and the Global Eco Village Network. So there is the network as a whole, which could arguably be called Gen is a global network of eco villages, uh, intentional communities, traditional villages in places in across the African continent, for instance. Um, and then within the network, there are multiple different organizations and legal entities, and in some cases, not legally ratified, but still entities in their own right. So there is the European network, Gen Europe, the African network, Gen Africa, the Genoa, which is the global eco village network of Oceania and Asia, there's CASA which is the Latin American network, Jenna, Eco Village Network of North America. Um, then there's an organization called Gen International that sort of acts as a, the professional node of the network as a whole and looks after a lot of the uh, cross regional collaboration. And then there's Next Gen, which is the youth arm of the Eco Village Network, which is in of itself broken up into these sorts of regional nodes. Um, currently I sit on the council of, I keep looking between the <laughs> camera and you, <laughs> I I was looking at Alex and the video, he's next to me too. So currently I sit on the council of Gen Europe, um, as which is, so I say it is, is serving as the trustee of the European eco village network, which is legally a German charity, although it's main head office is in Spain in Artera Bizimodo, an eco-village in the north of Spain. Um, I was elected to that role last year uh, for three, and it's three years minimum I'll be in the role. And I was elected by the General Assembly. So it's Gen Europe is a membership organization, and we have General Assembly, um, which happens each year when we also have our annual conference or gathering which this year will be in the na nature community in the south of Germany, hopefully with around 600 people from across the world. Nice. So yeah, currently that's my role within Gen. I also do a bit of freelance work for Gen International, who slightly confusingly has their office in Fintorn <laughs> and is a Scottish mm -hmm. charity. Um, do some freelance work for them on some projects locally around the area. Uh, historically, I was part of a small group of young people. Like, so in 2013, I went along to my first gen event, which was the gen Europe conference that was happening in the eco village called Schweibenalp in Switzerland. And I was convinced with some genuine leverage by a dear friend of mine called Ethan Hirsch Tauber to go along a few days early before the conference started, because there were some meetings of young people happening beforehand. And to be honest, I was very initially quite uninterested. I think, I mean, as you mentioned, I grew up in Fintorn and this, so this is when I was 20. Yeah, this is when I was 20. And I, well, I guess I was kind of tired is what I saw as the inevitable dynamics of young people in community and like, I didn't really want to just play. I wanted to like 
get stuff done and find stuff to do and was interested in projects and travel and stuff and traveling around but Ethan convinced me and I went along and there was probably about 30 35 young people there from all over the world who were very actively in on the most part very actively engaged in their communities and their areas surroundings I mean it, it some of the especially some of the people in from various Southeast Asian countries and South Asian countries like India and the Philippines and there were people there from Kenya and from Cameroon and um, a few other countries who were like I was amazed by what they were doing and what they were doing within the umbrella of the eco village network and I found it quite exciting and inspiring and at that meeting I was one of a few people selected or an asked nominated in in the process we're using which was sociocratic process to take on a sort of leadership role within what was called next gen which was an idea that had existed before and had sort of gained some momentum and then it kind of died out and almost all the momentum had been lost. We had a couple of handbooks and documents, but that was kind of it. And then over the sort of following five, six, seven years, myself at times, mainly just me, but with a few other people too. There were a few other people who came in a couple of years later, a couple of people, one or two others who sort of worked with me fairly consistently. I also dropped, disappeared at some times. But we really sort of held the development and growth of what became NextGen and what is NextGen now. Um, and I was very involved in sort of setting up the governance structures and the decision making and the yeah the the way the organization would communicate and collaborate and coordinate as well as make decisions specifically in Europe and then on the international level so where the different areas of next gen would sort of come together and meet because we were we we were quite clear that we didn't we didn't want the young people to be sort of siloed off from one another like the young people in Europe just working like next gen Europe, just working with gen Europe and Casa, Casa Jovenes <laughs> to be just working with Casa Latina, a sort of parent organization, whatever. We didn't want that. So we wanted to find a way for sort of next to all these regions to be meeting and collaborating and doing stuff together. Um, and so I, I was, that was my life for <laughs> quite a few <laughs> years, like, seven years or so um before i yes yeah, stepped out um and in the intervening years between then and now i was doing some work with gen international mainly just it support work and stuff like that um and then gen as a network as a whole decided to go through a bit of a reorganization and reorganizing a process of restructuring let's say and one of those was the idea of setting up a network steward circle as we called it which would be a circle with representatives from all of the different nodes so the people from europe so gen europe would send three people gen africa would send three people gen international would send three people next gen as a whole would send three people and i was asked by the gen international team that even though I was just a contractor, to step in as one of the people representing Gen International within this node um, because of my history and whatever in the organization. Um, so I did, and I spent just over a year, I think, in the, in sitting in the, NS, the NSC, as we called it, um, especially maybe a year and a half. I'm losing track a bit, uh, but supporting as well with the sort of facilitation and the sort of setting up of a lot of the practices um, that that circle had to practices and processes to work as efficiently and caringly as possible. Have you seen any like big conflicts happen, for instance, in your work with Jen or like anywhere like that? Are those usually like personal one on ones or do you think that it is something that's spread out across an organization? And I wonder where that appears. I mean, my work. genuinely on it, my genuinely honest answer is I don't think anything, I don't really think there's such a thing as 
interpersonal like one-on-one -on -one conflict i think like it, it it's i can't you know i'm i'm not saying that to dismiss how personal it can feel when having a conflict between two people and 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 how personal it is and and like that's where the cost is and the, the pain is is in me and in you but I don't know if I've ever, at least in my life, ever experienced a conflict with someone where the only things in the space was like just me and just that person. Mm. Like there there will be layers, whether it is stuff to do with social conditioning or the difference between my, like I've had the privilege and the frustration of falling in love with many people who do not share the same nationality and culture as me and it's hard because there are so many like little often really small things that even they don't know about themselves and small things that I don't know about myself that are just like assumptions like small little assumptions like cultural assumptions about like what certain words mean or like what certain behaviors mean and like and based on these assumptions we build whole stories that then like my partner can act completely in accordance without their intention or without their knowing can act completely in accordance with a story i have for days weeks maybe even months maybe even years and so every time they act in accordance with it i'm going ah more evidence and i'm building up this sense of like this solidness this belief of like this is how the world is that's how it's always been that's because that's how my parents were that's how my grandparents were that's how my everyone else i've known is and my partner and then one day they act outside of it and to them they've been acting in their own way the whole time but there's just the mismatch has never had an impact until now and then always i'm like but you but you and they're like no and i'm like why have you changed they're like i've not changed and you know whatever's going on and and it, it's it could be social conditioning it could be something weird to do with patriarchy it could be the odd movie you just or something in the field whatever and it's the same in organizations it, it, it's like there's so many weird like i've repeatedly seen it's like this is it when it especially when it comes to pe people stepping into roles or positions of power or account of like large level of responsibility by power i mean like the capacity to affect change. A powerful position is someone with a lot of capacity to affect change within whatever situation. And it's like you never really know what somebody is going to be like in a position of power until they enter into a position of power for the first mm -hmm. time. Like you never really, really know. And whether that is a team leader, <laughs> whether that is a CEO, whether that is a parent, whether that is, you, you know, a babysitter, whatever it is, whether that is the friend in charge of the itinerary for the <laughs> holiday, it's like, or even in a partnership, it's like, all of a sudden, it's like, you're, everything's going fine, everything's great when you're sharing, and it's like, all right, okay, you're going to be in charge of the booking the flights, and then all of a sudden, you're like, who is this person? Or like, <laughs> You select someone to be in a position of a team leadership position or a position of responsible like CEO position of an organization or your community or whatever, and they change overnight. It's like something is different in them because it's like as soon as they enter that field, and, and it might not even be they have changed. They as a person might be the same, but they've taken something on. There's the field of this organization, of this arguably it has its own energetic field and as soon as you're in this position of power you then maybe feel protective and whatever and it, it, it's like people have children and then their behavior changes all of a sudden they're a different person same with animals i'm not saying being a ceo is the same as being a father but i am saying that people get defensive and protective and you can never know what it's going to do to someone i think another thing is that when you when you have more power suddenly you have the ability you say you know they have the ability to make more change you can make more change happen with less effort so you, you do something and, and you don't realize how much impact that has for other people because you can kind of affect change 
kind of with more 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 power without realizing it i think like being a parent for example you've got a small child if you do something that like you might do with an adult you, you're kind of affecting more change yeah so what might feel like it's really scary as a kid from a parent might not be from the parent's point of view might not seem like a really big thing they're gonna kind of seeing it from the other person's point of view they need to kind of be compassionate for yeah. the power they have yeah i mean it's it's i think you know it's in some ways it's an old argument what what makes a better leader someone who was trained to be a leader like specifically trained to be a leader and has been educated in all of that or somebody who has come up the ranks or whatever within an organization and knows really what it's like to work at every layer of that specific organization but maybe is not really a leader like they still they need to figure that out it, it's you know for an organization do you hire in someone from the outside who's got a proven track record but maybe doesn't know the company or do you promote somebody and and it's a it's it's tricky right and it, i think it's the same in anywhere in any community or any anything because if you're not careful there are, i mean everyone's got blind spots and the blind spot might be not being aware of the impact of your what your decisions have maybe either culturally or operationally within any ent any, any collective collection of people um or it, or or it might be just like not actually knowing how things are done or or being sensitive to the history i mean here in fintorn it it's you know we're going through a massive period of transformation and I think, you know, there is an argument to be made for not getting too bogged down in the history and what's happened in the past when trying to move forward and going, OK, maybe we just try and, you know, fresh page, new leaf. Like, you know, <laughs> let's not get too hung up. And especially for some of the people who are maybe newer or have come in during this time and transition, it, I, I totally see why that would be a really attractive op option. It's like as that is already a, arguably a pretty sensible option. Uh, way forward and with its own momentum even with people who've been here for a while of course they'd latch onto that why would if they don't need to learn about everything in the past to everything why would they and at the same time the consequence of that is there are some people who have real emotional attachment to some of that there's like sometimes really unresolved feeling, unresolved painful moments, unresolved trauma, unresolved what these unresolved things that, yes, even though it happened all that time ago, it's still painful and it still ha is still impacting their ability to be present. And if you don't know that or at least know it's there, then it doesn't matter how shit hot you are and how amazing you are. It, uh, being a leader if you're not really aware of all the nuances going on in the space then your actions are going to have impact on those people like almost certainly just the fact that you don't know and you don't know what to see then then, then those people are not going to feel seen and that alone will have its own impact to segue from that do you think um so a, a lot of your work's also in sociocracy do you think that sociocracy as a governing system helps to avoid lots of conflicts that often come up? Like, does it change the fields of, um, you know, what people are dealing with and working in? Is that part of like what draws you to sociocracy? I would say. Can you does, also it, tell it us in general about sociocracy? Yeah, let's see if I can do that without taking a whole hour. <laughs> <laughs> um, sociocracy is a, I mean, in some way it's just a word, socio and ocracy, roughly translating to, you know, decision making by the peers. Um, there are a few different variants of sociocracy. There's what many people refer, I refer to as classic sociocracy, some people to dynamic governance or circle forward method, which is a like certified uh, framework or methodology that's aim is to bring equivalence to hierarchies 
and it does this through certain structural changes and uh, values and policies and agreements and processes and ways and uh, principles and sort of introduces and it says if you do this and you implement or apply this framework then you will have an equivalent hierarchy where it will do a lot to deal with disbalances of power um, and in, in a very effective way is, is the aim of it. Can you explain equivalent hierarchy? Yeah, so equivalence rather than it, it, like equivalence or equity rather than equality is kind of like to each their own, but in reverse. <laughs> so it's about the sort of base, the principle of it on the ground level is any decision that's, if a decision is being made, then anyone who is impacted by that decision should get the opportunity to object object to it. That does not mean that everybody will get the same amount of time and space. If the decision that is being made is what bridge do we build? Sure, the people who are going to be using the bridge should get a say, but like you're going to give more time and weight to the arguments being brought forward by the engineers, not just the average person who's going to be using the bridge. Mm. However, you do want to hear from the people using the bridge because they, they are going to be impacted by it in an organization. Yeah. So like an example, one of the legends of sociocracy in the early days is that the organization that first started working with this is they were a Dutch organization and there was a big economic crash. And they basically wanted to, needed to fire a whole department, make redundant a whole department. So they notified them of this and the department came forward and said, we have an alternative. Keep us on the books and we'll work for three months unpaid right, or like we'll work for three months unpaid to figure out if there is a way that we as a department can become profit making rather than you making as redundant. And now the board members, you know, they couldn't even, they wouldn't have, you can't ask that of the workers. <laughs> you can't say we're not going to make you redundant. We'll make you redundant in three months if you can't, when we're not being paid, figure out something. But but the workers could ask for that of themselves. They rather than making us redundant, how about this? They said yes, and they went through a whole process, and they started becoming profit making, and they were allowed to stay on. So you know, it, it, so it's about bringing equivalence to the hierarchy in, in the Netherlands, as far as I'm aware, for instance, if your organization is a sociocracy, then you basically get to bypass a lot of union laws, because it's seen that if you are certified as being a sociocracy, that the rights of the workers are so enshrined within the structure of the organization that it's not needed. You don't need a third party external body fighting on behalf of the, the workers against the board or whatever, because actually, it's all there. Um, so there are other variants of sociocracy that, that I work with that break it down into more what I see as more manageable bits and pieces and allow room for playing with things like more decentralized ways of working, not just working uh, equivalent hierarchy is great, but it's still a hierarchy, which personally I don't see as being actually the most effective or efficient way of running a, a group of people in many situations. Um, such as sociocracy 3.0, which is what I primarily work with. Um, but I would not say in any instance that I think they help avoid conflict necessarily. I think it's more that it, it gives more channels for dealing with conflict. Like, I don't think it's really possible to like avoid conflict because people generally, people only get into conflict about things they care about. Mm. I'm not actually sure if it is possible to have a conflict over something unless both people care about something that's in the middle that they're fighting yeah. over. Like, I don't really know how that would work. Even, I mean, it might be like, you know, tangentially or whatever, but people only generally get really angry and pissed off and start fighting for things they care about. When you get a bunch of people together who are working towards a common vision or a goal, whether or not, whether it's just because they're being paid to do so or because it's their their home and their community or whatever, 
people care about it. And when you care about it with these layers of everything I talked about, of who I am as a person, layered with my cultural normalities, laid with my parents, laid with my politics, maybe laid with religion and spiritual beliefs. I'm always going to have my own ideas different from at least some people about what the best way to express my care is through the decisions that are being made and the work that's being done. So it's why I talk about conflict transformation rather than like mediation or conflict avoidance mm -hmm. or whatever because it's like i'm not personally i'm not so interested in just making the conflict go away and like papering over the cracks and like calm down let's all you know <laughs> get calm going back to home um, and like let's go back to peace and harmony and sing together and make it all personally i because that's actually denying potentially what the gold is at the heart of it all which is that it's actually in some way like if i get really angry about something because i care and someone tries to push that anger down by telling me I shouldn't be angry or that anger isn't right or whatever. The only real way to do that is to suppress my care. Mm. It's, it's to sort of push down and deny the fact that actually I really care about this person or this place or this whatever. And I just don't think that's the most effective way. Like it's it, like, it's, I mean, it's effective if you're trying to get the job done, whatever the, get the thing done whatever the thing is whether it is stepping into a relationship it's like to show up if you're really trying to show up in your fullest and get something done i mean talking about relationship as a thing to get done is a bit weird but if i want to do a good job in my relationship and be a good partner or a good lover or a good boyfriend or a good brother or a good father or a good son it's like what's really an effective way to do that we're not talking about efficiency it's not maximizing and minimum value and minimizing input and all that it's just about getting the job done and i don't believe that suppressing my care or telling other people they should suppress their care is the way to do it i would much prefer to like step in and explore what's actually going on because from what i've seen like often that that's really the way to diffuse a situation and I've seen that countless. I mean, sometimes boundaries need to be drawn. You know, it, it, it's, I've been in Citra Calais. You mentioned it at mm -hmm. the beginning. And, you know, it was a refugee camp and there were traumatized humans who traveled, you know, halfway, you know, across continents to get there and exhausted volunteers who were giving everything to try and help people. And still sometimes, there would be tension, there would be aggression, sometimes threats, often threat, very often threats of violence. And, you know, sometimes what was needed was a boundary to be drawn. Like, no, like here, here is the line. If you cross that line, deal's over. However, as soon, if, it's, if you see and you get that, then like, what's actually the way? Now I've got somebody who is like, maybe a really traumatized, potentially really traumatized person who has potentially seen unimaginable violence and hardship in their life and they are really upset they're really angry whatever because their tent they've been told there are no more tents today or they've missed the deadline for the food or whatever and like telling them to calm down <laughs> isn't really going to help the situation mm. you know yes being clear with them that if they go away and come back with a knife or a baseball bat or they start a fire that isn't going to help the situation and being clear with them that there is a line but once that line has been drawn and if that line is respected i've still got a human in front of me who's feeling stuff and what i saw in calais and i've seen since is if i can go in and actually if i am resourced enough to sort of be with that intensity and show them that i'm not that i'm not going to back away and i will be there with them then like it's amazing how quickly that anger turns into something else. And all of a sudden you realize we find out together that anger is just a mask for the sadness. Mm. Yes, they're pissed off that they don't have food or they don't have a tent, but really they're scared that they're going to go really hungry and they're not going to have somewhere to sleep at night and they're not going to survive or they're not going to get whatever. And I don't have this. I didn't, I did not have the solutions for those problems, but getting to the point where they can express that to me often quite quickly and in promising them that I can hear that I can see that and there still aren't any more tents 
like I still like I hear you I see it's like only when they actually really felt see what I saw was only when they really felt seen and heard did they actually really believe me and they got it and it's and it's still it's not about trying to take the power that that anger has away from them you know they still need to be angry to live and to survive and to do all these things it's not about trying to remove them mm -hmm. you know or disempower them it's just like in that situation there where what i'm where what we're dealing with is a potentially really explosive situation it's like where the where the the uh the priority is reducing the risk of violence that's a much better way of dealing with it than like the way the riot police on the outside of camp were when an angry refugee came to them which was just threaten them and point out that no matter how angry they got, they weren't going to be able to beat the wall of police with tear gas. You, you know, like that doesn't, it didn't actually help anything at all. So conflict transformation. How long were you in Cali for? What was yeah. it that led you there? Uh, what was it that hmm. led me there? Um, uh, it was October 2015. There was an article in The Guardian, um, which amusingly, in some way, because The Guardian wrote about it, then all of the tabloids and the right wing press wrote about it, which then raised awareness about it way more than one article in The Guardian <laughs> ever could have. And what it said is there's basically a bunch of volunteers from the UK are there helping and trying to figure stuff out. And there was like 10,000 or there was 6,000 refugees at the time there. And it was chaos. And then I met someone who had just been there and I was like, okay, how do I go? What can I go and help? I was a bit, I didn't have much to do at that entire time. I didn't have much money. And they put me in contact with someone who was building shelters there. And I was like, I, I can hit a nail with a hammer and saw wood, saw roughly in a straight line. Um, I can go to help. Um, so I, yeah, put the word out here in the Findhorn community at the time. This is November, December 2015. and said, I have time. I don't have the money and I need money to pay for my youth hostel and whatever. Um, so that, so then I went over in that first winter and I was there for about four and a half, five weeks. No, about a month and a half, so about six, seven weeks with a wee break in the middle where I went back, went over to London to see my grandparents. Um, yeah, and then that following summer, in the summer of 2016, I went back for another six weeks or so. What, what, what did you have a question? I was, was going to, it feels like quite a, on a, a lot more small scale, you know, translating that idea of of seeing seeing conflict and seeing anger as a representation of people caring how what do you see in the the finton community at the moment or in the park what's 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 your observation can you narrow that question down uh let's narrow it down well, you must see a lot in the park then um what do you see people caring about that's behind some of the conflict that i'm observing anyway um what do I see people caring about? <laughs> wow. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'll preface this by, you know, most of this is, it's still my stories. It's the observations I have. It doesn't mean it's true or that I'm even attached to it being true, but I think it, it it's like, it's so fucking complex. It's like, it's so complex, you know, we're, we're talking about, for some people, it is a spiritual vision. It is about that community, even the eco, even just the park, the eco village, it's about so much more than any one person there. It is about working in alignment with a 60 year spiritual vision and path. So it's tough because then when you start talking about the personal needs or issues or things within the place, it, it, it's, it's like, yeah, but what about this? What about this grand vision? But at the same time it is people, it's people's homes. It's their life. And I mean,
yeah, I can talk about, maybe I can talk about for myself. Mm. And I think what I can talk about for myself, I'm fairly confident would be relevant to other people. And the recent community meeting was sitting there and a proposal was put forward to have a sort of community buyout of the park, which might sound crazy to some people because they go, don't the community already own it? But anyway, not really is the answer. Yes, kind of, but not really. <laughs> and with the current initial proposal, the way it was being proposed is it would be bought out by an organization whose membership would be residents of the park, people who own land there or live there either through a rental agreement or because they own land there. Now, personally, I think that's a great idea. In fact, I'm not actually sure if there is any way to like really have that place stay with some tangible idea of intentional community or an eco village if there is not a transition to community ownership of at least most of the, at least the common spaces if not even most of the residential spaces let's say not all of them but most of them like at least the places that are currently like the affordable housing some of it is under community ownership arguably through the park eco village trust which is a membership organization which i'm a member of everyone should be a member of because it's one of the only organizations in the community that owns land that has a membership structure some isn't it's owned by nfd which is a company with its own trustees and shareholders whatever not well the finger founder anyway blah blah so on some level, I really agree with it. I think it is the only way forward. And there was this whole conversation about what it costs and people were like probably something, maybe an initial fee, maybe a monthly subscription and all of that. And they're like, we want to keep it affordable. I'm sitting there going, I can't afford to live in the park. Like that's my current problem is that like my father owns a house in the park, but I can't afford to live there not in his house. I mean, I can't afford to live there either, but that's for relationship issues. I, my, <laughs> I can't, my relationship with my father can't, can't take the brunt of that cost in a long-term thing. It's wonderful for short-term, but yeah. But like, I'm trying to buy somewhere outside. Legally right now, I'm registered at his house. So I'm like, hey, I'm trying to make a stable home for myself outside the community because I want to be in the community and I need to maybe have a bridge. And I'm like, I'm sitting here like proactively supporting a process that is disenfranchising me from this place that I call home. Just pause there. We're just going to pause and you can cut it together because my mum's coming in. <laughs> or you can keep that in if you <laughs> like. So, yeah, there's this, you know, this. it's like that. So just for me alone, I'm like, for the community, I think it's not only a good idea, I think it's what's needed. But I want to be a part of the community. I consider it my home and I see consider my home to be the park. That that's where I grew up, it's where it's my roots are, it's it's where my placenta is buried, it's where my parents got married, it's that I was at, it it's where I my mother went into labour with me, wasn't born, a bit too difficult. I had to get rushed to Inverness, but you know, like it, it's, it's my home and it is where I, I've been in denial about it a lot of my life because I wanted to go travel and whatever, but like, actually it's the place I keep coming back to and on some level, and, but like, here I am supporting that while disenfranchising myself, not know, like going, well, then am I like going to lose my ability to actually have a say in whether or not I get access to my own community here. But at the same time, my father owns a house there. I mean, he, he doesn't own the whole thing, but it is his house. And at some day, hopefully in the not too distant, no, 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 hopefully not in the, I'm getting this around. Hopefully in the distant future, it will be mine or mine and my sister's. And you know, and so that alone is this thing. It's like this is it's like this inheritance thing because I know there are plenty of people who own properties in the park where it's you know there are some people who are individuals who own multiple properties in the park and they live off renting them. You know, okay, that's one thing. There are other people 
where like the house that they own in the park, sure, it might be worth a lot of money, but maybe that's it. Maybe they don't have a pension. Maybe they don't have investments. Maybe they don't have family wealth. What they have is that house in the park, and then they maybe even have children. And for them, it's like, this is their legacy. Like they're not, they what they want. So as soon as you're starting to talk about conversations like community ownership and someone in the hall the other day even said, okay, does this mean we're going to move towards a direction where some of the private landowners are going to be asked to like start selling their property to the community? It's like, okay, but then like, you know, it's people's homes. There are developments being proposed in the name of trying to solve the housing issue developments that I could potentially be make use of like affordable homes in various different options developments that for them to go ahead would require other people in the community who I care about and who've been around for a long time to lose their home it would require to forcibly move them off the property they're on to maybe take stop it being two properties with two two plots with two caravans on it to being like one multi multi story affordable home and you've also got four people there or whatever. And and it, it it's you know, that makes it tricky for me. I don't like I don't it, it it it's you know, it puts me I feel like then I'm in an uncomfortable position where it is and, and I can't even imagine what it's like to be one of the people in that position. It it, it it's like I'm don't you know, I definitely don't envy them. Yeah. In fact, one of the one of those plots was recently the right to reside and have a lease on one of those plots was recently put up in the community and it transitioned and there was an application process. And I specifically did not go for that plot, even though in many ways it was perfect for me because I did not want to, I was just so, did not want to be in the position that they're now in. Like, I was just like, I was like, even though I want a home and all of that, I was like, I'm not willing. I wasn't willing to put myself in the position, what I saw as a position of conflict. <laughs> like, I didn't want to be there. I was like, I am putting myself in the firing line. And I was like, that me. And when it happens, I, I'm not, what am I going to do? Go, ah, why are you trying? It's like, I knew, it's like, I, I knew what I'd be getting myself in for. And I wasn't willing to take that on which is, you know, now I look at the people there and it, it's hard because some part of me is like, well, you fucking knew what you were getting on. But at the same time, I'm like, okay, but like I don't actually feel like it's my place to judge them just because I, because, you know, I have the privilege of having a father in the park and a mother in the village. It, it's my need for a home might be different from theirs. I don't know who they are and what their history is. I mean, I know some of it, but not all of it. And so like, who am I to... I, I, you know, put myself on a pedestal. I'm, I, I'm not going to do that. I'm not willing to do that. But it doesn't mean that it's not, you know, and this is me, one person in relation to what's going on. Then you've got two, three, four hundred people who all with their own <laughs> unique things. And, and it, 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 it's, you know, it, it, it's, it can seem like a bit of a mess. I have a question related to that. So you've been to around 50 different eco-village and community projects around the planet. In terms of um, the issues that the eco-village in Fintorn is going through right now, how do you think Fintorn compares? And how do you think Fintorn compares to these places in general? Where does Fintorn stand amongst all of that after your experiences of them? I think we're nowhere near as special as we sometimes like to think we are. And mostly I mean that from a place of like the issues we're dealing with are so not unique, <laughs> like so not unique. Um, they're just not. And even the fact that we seem to think our issues are unique and want to deal with them out with ourselves rather than looking elsewhere for support. Mm -hmm isn't unique <laughs> <laughs> like that that's the, you know it, it's like other places i go are doing the same thing and i'm like we're dealing with the same stuff in fintorn why like why don't like we have a little bit with the gen gathering last year and we had a meeting an informal meeting on communities in crisis 
and there were people there from like four of the major old communities within Europe and a handful of new ones and we're all going through some our own version of the same thing and it's like why don't we collaborate more figure this out more and then like no, nothing happened because we all went home and then got so busy in our own processes that you know didn't it didn't it still it still didn't happen I think I'm, you know, I don't want to devalue what being existing for 60 years can do and what knowledge and wisdom is in a place. But in many ways, I, to some degree, I think it doesn't really count for much at this point. Because the reality is, is that the place we're in now is has so many of the hallmarks of what the processes you go through when starting a community like that that like there's not that much difference if you when i've seen people who are going through that process of starting a community in their initial years it is like it's almost exactly the same we're having conversations about the name of the community a vision for the community governance structures and decision making procedures conflict transformation who is who do we classify as a member and who do we not how do we get people to join how do we not what sort of land ownership model do we have do we buy the place collectively or do we not how do we earn money in the community how much money should we earn how many organizations do we need to get like these are all like community starter pack <laughs> topics right <laughs> like right community starter pack topic the difference is is like actually our job is much harder because we're not a bunch of people we it's not like we haven't invested much and we're all there and like oh if it doesn't work out i can always leave or it, it, it's people who've in some of the people who are in the room have invested most of their lives in this place there are people here who've been here for you know 30 40 years maybe even 50 years and some yeah some people have been here for close to 50 years some people it's everything they know is here you know it, it not me i've i've traveled a lot but you know there, there's some people who have their entire life their entire financial capital invested in the place and not in the you, you know so like it, it it's some people it's their parents died here or their children were born here some children <laughs> were born here and and so like it, it's you know it's it's tough like it's 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 a tough situation but yeah like it, it it's in some way I think it, it's almost needed to treat this as if we're starting again and I think we were lucky that we had the sixtieth mm. birthday last year which it gave a very helpful and convenient like point to build a story around the story of like, what will the next 60 years hold? I mean, it's 60. What does 60 mean? You know, normally it's like 50 or well, the next 50 years or the next hundred years or it's, it's a kind of random number. <laughs> like it's not that except it's a factor of 10. That's kind of it. There isn't actually that much. The number six, the number 60, there's nothing. 70 for some people will be a thing but 60 is a bit of a random number but you can see like the the way we of a community have sort of latched onto this thing of like oh a birthday 60 years what will the next 60 years hold in a much broader sense than we did with 50 years because at 50 years it was just a nice dreaming exercise now it's a question of survival it's like we're looking we're trying to work to see if we can survive and that is one of the sort of things we've rallied around and I think that is, maybe that's part of the answer to your question. You know, it's, it's like what's different about Fintorn is we have this sort of, these numbers, these grand numbers, 50 years, 60 years, whatever, that we can rally around and that we can sort of take some importance from. The shadow side of that is then you can get people who go, oh, we've been around this long, we're going to go on forever. You know, it's the banks are too big to fail history is done mm. <laughs> like history is over all these grand things that humans the roman empire will never <laughs> fall all these all these things it's like fintorn will go on it's like okay that's the shadow of it but if we work with it consciously it gives us a lot of like really helpful like ammunition almost to sort of like to work with and go oh okay because in like i believe in the power of stories 
it, it, it's, it, it's if you can find a story to rally around, then that's great. I mean, Fintorn. Fintorn was built on stories. That's what it was. A story of the giant mm -hmm. cabbages, a story of Eileen's guidance, the story of Peter's proactive, <laughs> spiritual proactiveness. The place was built on stories. So now it's almost like, okay, well, what is our, what's the new story that we want to, we had a conference here called the new story summit even. So it is kind of this thing of like, what, what is this story we're trying to weave together here? What could you boil down to in essence? What is it that you are saying, you know, people are fighting for survival. What is it? Cause they're not going to lose their house. They're not going to lose the shop. I mean, it's not like. Well, of the community. What, what about the community? Cause the people are still there. So what is it like that they're fighting for? Cause they're still there. They're still living there. They've still got their friends there. Well, I don't think it's necessarily that certain. A lot of people's, like when it's people's jobs and livelihoods rely on some of what is the community. It's not necessarily that simple because there's always the risk that some people will move and leave. Wait, they won't be able to afford to stay. When the common land is not owned by the community as a whole and is tied up within organizations that could go bankrupt or could decide to sell to somebody else, there's a risk that some of the reasons why people are there are taken away and removed with access is removed. And, and then there's the values and principles beneath it all and the spiritual vision of the place and the, and the spiritual glue of it. It, it. It's why do people come to Fintorn in the first place? Sure, the houses are nice, the people are great, but there's very few people that that's the only reason they came. It is all the bits in between. It's the spaces in between. It's the nature in between. It's the connections in between. And that's the stuff that's at risk. The culture. In essence, culture uh, and <laughs> communal areas. So I'm like boiling it right down. I'd say I'd say it feels like the spiritual essence is potentially one of the things at threat, and then common spaces and land, and it, it, it's you come together to live in community because you want to be together and do things together, and if you start when the community center went and the sanctuary went. We lost a whole bunch of the spaces that we could do things together and we could be in together. <laughs> so then it's, it starts to become, you a know, housing estate. exactly. Then it's just like a housing estate. And at some point in time, people go, well, hang on. Why am I living here when I could just live out there? I mean, even the value of the place is not, you know, what, what brings value to a place? Is it just the people and the, how nice the houses are, or also the utilities and the resources and whatever else is in and around it. And then it is for a lot of people. I think it's a principle. They live there because they believe that living more communitarianly and in a sense of togetherness is, it is a better way to live. And it's and argue, maybe they even want to do it because they want to demonstrate and prove that it's possible. And I think for some people, the thought, if a lot of that goes, it's almost like we failed. At least um, it could be, let's say. But, I, you know, I would say that's something that I sense in the field. For some people, it's like, no, this is our last chance to prove that this works. You know, otherwise, I mean, I'm going to be a cynic for a moment, but then... You know, is any of the books about the magic of Fintorn really, you know, did they really mean anything if in the end it could, we didn't succeed? I think they do. I mean, you think I, they I, do? I mean, I, I think they do too, but you tell me why they think, you think they do. I think they do because I think the story they tell is about people believing in something in, 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 in spite of the odds and managing to create it. So I, I think that that story in itself, whether what happens like 50, 40 years later, doesn't necessarily matter because that was what happened after that. But the, the, what those people did when they founded the place and what they created is a story in itself, which is inspiring. Well, maybe it's as simple as that then. What people are fighting for now is just because they... I think as long as people in that place still sit down and meditate and find or walk through the park 
and find within themselves some intuition or spiritual guidance or whatever that there's still a place for the community in the world and they'll keep fighting for it and fighting for its survival. And it seems like that's still the case because we have a hundred people coming along to meetings. So it's clearly that people still think there's something to do. Mm -hmm. Generally, they would, I don't can't imagine people would be showing up if they didn't think there was a future that's possible. And then layered on top of that is people's individuals, values and principles. And some of those are to do with mostly communitarian. So if you start taking away from the community, the things that sort of give it the communitarian identity from the eco village, the things that make it communitarian identity, you're going to start to lose some people. And all of a sudden people are going to start walking around and going, this isn't what I want to fight for. This isn't, this isn't it. Already you have some people saying that and doing that. I mean, the idea of buying the park is in some way it is a declaration that actually what's currently going on can't be saved like it's such a transition and such a shift that it's going what we have now and the way of doing it now it's run its course it has it is no longer working for us it is not working we need such a radical and so we need to make a radical shift to something that like maybe to the outsiders it's all the same for those inside, it is, it's clearly not the same. Um, yeah. Maybe there's something promising in it. I don't know whether I keep... There's a lot of people saying that we're not going to survive it. on the larger scale unless we make some radical shifts. So maybe there is a whole sort of like microcosm to macrocosm thing there of here's a community, here's it making a radical shift that has to happen. Let's see what happens next. hundred percent. I mean, this is part of when I say we're not special. It's because also I do think we're just mirroring what's <laughs> going, everything that's going on in the world. And I think, you know, for me personally, through the lens that I look at stuff through, it, it, it's, I, I, to be on the cutting edge, which is often how Fintorn was referred to, it, it's like, it, you need to be on the cutting edge of what's relevant in the world today. And personally, I don't see the point in living in community or an eco village if you're not working on stuff and then sharing what you've worked on with the outside world. It just seems a bit pointless to me, in, especially in something of this size. Um, it's about experimentation. And I think that was always at the heart of Fintorn. And what are the things that are relevant in the world today? Sure, ecology and carbon neutral and all that sort of stuff is some of what is relevant so yeah it makes sense to me to be working on those things but a big thing that's also relevant right now is like working across divides and going through proving it's possible to go through mass cultural transformation within a unit of people and proving it's possible to um collaborate even where there are disagreement in the name of a sort of broader vision or a broader idea to, to work together to save something. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, if Fintorn wants to be relevant, sure, going carbon neutral by 2030 would be really great if we can manage to do that. But like the thing that will make Fintorn's legacy exist through the next 60 years is if we can survive this and if we can go through some sort of transition process where we come out the other end arguably stronger and clearer as a community like like more clarity about what the community is and how to whatever and if we can come through everything all of that with something like that then we'll have another 60 years of books written about the place i mean hell i might even be able to pick <laughs> one about the place or you guys might <laughs> i mean sure these podcasts will take off <laughs> um you, you know that that will have way more of an impact on the world and on whatever than just us going carbon neutral like the going carbon neutral thing would be great but like in terms of global impact, I think if we can nail this, it'll have much more. There's much more potential for global impact than experimenting with a few cutting edge, cool carbon neutral projects. I want to actually amend my comment about the the story of the the history of the space being important because you know stories get forgotten about. Books end up going out of print, 
And at the end of the day, actually, I, I just, I, I, I've changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I've changed my mind. <laughs> um, well, you started talking about sort of the next 60 years. And I was thinking like, yeah, the, the story as relevant as it was in like the 1970s. Yeah. It's like, as time goes on, it just like becomes like more and more relevant to where the world is now. It was a story for then to get from there to there. But now we're in like 2023. What's the story we need to get people to 2060? Yeah. Like we need a new story and that's something that has to be done now. It's like a living story. So I've changed my mind. Yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> you know, I would say to, you know, now I'll counterbalance that and say, you know, some of the stories of Fintorn, it's, you know, so the, the thing, the question I always have is I realize that like, it's hard for me personally, even though I'm quite a cynic at heart at times, it is hard for me not to believe in magic with some of the stories that I've heard about this place from people who were there at the time, right? Because it is people sharing about things that are, would be categorized as like miracles or magic or divine intervention very clearly. And I'm hearing them from people who were there at the time. And like from enough different sources and they're matching up and 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 it, it it's and like and i'm aware that a large part of where that magic comes from for me is hearing them from the people who experienced them or with, saw it happening and they're relaying it to me in that way and i'm aware that like some of that magic is lost when i retell those stories not a huge amount because I was born here and people know that I trust those person, especially if the person knows me and know how much of a cynic I am, can be, then when I tell those, it's thing. But, you know, when those people tell the stories and what about when, like, at some point in time, it's not like we should forget, but it is what, what place should they have? And I think that's, it's like, do we want to be known just for those stories mm -hmm. or do we want, like, at some point it, it's... Maybe it makes sense that those are, you know, the stories that come out once a year or whatever. Like, it, it's yes, they will always bring some people to the community. But do we really, even as a teenager, like I'd occasionally have people rocking up in the community, normally American <laughs> tourists, and asking for the direction to the giant ve vegetables. And I'm like, I mean, you're about 40 years too late. It's like, you know, down there, turn left back into the 60s <laughs> or the 70s and you'll find them and like and almost it's part of me that was starting to feel a bit awkward i'm like is this really what we want people coming here for what we did all that time ago is that really what we want to play off or do we want people coming here for what we're doing now or what we're going to or even what we're trying to do for tomorrow i mean that's the really thing you know it, it's people there are some places in the UK, like the Centre for Alternative Technology, Cats and Wales, people don't go there just for what they have done or what they've got now, but also for what they're trying to do, what they're experimenting with. It is about what, and they go there to learn and to be a part of what's next. And I'm like, well, wouldn't that, you know, wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't that be exciting? And I think that's part of why I stayed away from Fintorn a lot in the, my 20s was because... I didn't really feel like it was my place to impose my idea about what was really cool on a, an existing establishment, no matter how much I saw it as my home. I was like, but it's also other people's homes and a lot of them are getting a bit older and I don't want to come along and start shaking. Why do I think I should get to come along and shake things up? It was only actually when the fires happened and the community centre and the sanctuary burned down like two nights before I, in the night or something before I was due to come home to Fintorn after being away for like, almost a year due to lockdown and COVID and getting stuck out in the country. And I was nervous to come home, a bit scared, unsure, often the case, because I love it here, but I often felt a bit stuck and like there wasn't room for me. The fires happened and I was like, I'm going home to live. Like at least for now, I'm going to go home because I was like, I, it, like it just made, I was like, the worst case scenario has mm -hmm. happened. Like it can't get any, like people have already lost most of their jobs from the foundation, getting, making people redundant. Now the community center and the sanctuary, I was like, we've hit rock bottom or not return, you know, socially and culturally, there was still some way to drop, but like in many ways, the worst case scenarios have happened. 
So people are going to have to go through a process of rebuilding. And of course, there are going to be some people who just want to put it back the way it was. But I kind of suspected that it was going to be less that not all the people who had been trying to protect the way it was before would now want it to go back to how that was. Because most of the motivation, my suspicion was most of the motivation for trying to keep things the same and no, don't change, was more because of the fear of change and disruption on their lives than because they really liked the way things were. Mm. And like, you know, now they've had all of that disruption, COVID, pandemic, everything changed. They go, oh, I can survive. Some community center gone, the sanctuary gone, jobs have been lost. So I suspected, and it seems rightfully so, I feel quite like I've been proven right with this, that actually a lot of people, especially actually a lot of the older generations are going, no, all right, that's what can we do? How can we rebuild? You know, what can we do? What? How can we do that actually grows on where it was? And people are remembering what didn't work about the CC. And they're remembering that actually the sanctuary was tiny and was like a shed <laughs> <laughs> that had problems. And like maybe we do something more beautiful and different and a bit, maybe do we want something grand? Do we not want something grand? Like lady, like people are like, oh, okay. And they're getting involved and interested mm. again. And so I came back and now I feel like there is this room and I'm like, oh, okay, I'm not, I don't, think i doubt i'm gonna get everything my way <laughs> it'd be cool if it was but what i do think is is i do still see and feel room for me to bring myself in and my hope would be that the fintorn that comes out of this is less one that lives in the past and the present and it's more one that lives in the present and the future it feels like a good point to sort of wrap up um yeah, it's sort of it's it feels to me like oh we're almost creating a community on the new on the next level, like re reforming mm -hmm. it, you know, breaking it down, restarting again. Um but we've gone on for quite a long time. Any other questions you want to ask Calm or any other comments or or insights or I think that's a good place to wrap up the podcast and a good place to start the next sixty years together. <laughs> 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 thanks everyone for listening okay. this has been our thank fin turn thank you Jake